for for uh, people to filter in here at E2 Tech. Instead, we have the uh, introductory remarks for me, which can uh, be skipped. So it's my honor and pleasure to uh, welcome you to our event today. I'm Marty Groman of uh, E2 Tech, joined by uh, Riley Ewald. Hi, Riley. And Bryant Wolf. Bryant is uh, uh, soon to be L2 at USM uh, Maine Law, excuse me, and uh, is, is uh, working with us thanks to the Bride Family Fellowship over the summer. So welcome, Bryant. Hopefully I got about two thirds of that correct. Uh, you know us, uh, we're the uh, conveners and connectors. I uh, just had an email today uh, from somebody who said that uh, they were able to access uh, funding for their entire industry based on a connection made at a recent E2 Tech Forum, and it was even an online one. So that's uh, that's pretty good. And what we're trying to do with these is that kind of discussion forums. Remember how we used to uh, hang around afterwards in the hall and talk through an issue of the day? Uh, that's what these are meant to be about. So we'll have a pres uh, presentation from Sebastian moderated by Chris, but uh, then it becomes quite participatory and you are encouraged to stay engaged. This is a really interesting topic and we've got, uh, the benefit of your attendance. So uh, please let us hear from you and let us know what we can do to connect you with an opportunity. We have banks, real estate agents, uh, researchers, attorneys, patent attorneys, uh, mentors, you name it. If we can be helping your business, you know, I helped somebody recently find a location for a manufacturing business. Uh, that's my job, uh, connector in chief, so to, so to speak. Uh, your participation in E2 Tech makes it possible for us to make it free for uh, students and public officials. And uh, we appreciate that. That's a big part of uh, what we do and how we uh, get the right people in the room and the next generation, so to speak. And uh, mention us on LinkedIn today, if you would. Uh, we're doing a lot with uh, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we specifically, we're helping uh, people of diverse backgrounds get jobs in our industry. I can think of three so far this year. And uh, it's uh, enjoyable and engaging work to be doing. And uh, so many U2 Tech members are hiring. Uh, so and we partner up with Intwork. You can check out intwork.co to check them out. And Main Technology Institute uh, supports us and we support them. Uh, this is a great organization. I think there was a major uh, funding deadline yesterday. I'm sure they're swamped. Uh, but the amount of good uh, that this organization does for uh, Maine's economy is literally <laughs> can't be measured is so much. If you have an idea, though, let us help you shepherd it towards MTI. That's a big part of, uh, of what we do. I connected an entrepreneur uh, who's looking at a uh, funding mechanism for um, uh, for growing farming infrastructure la just last week, and uh, they're kind of off to a start in discussions with MTI. I'm happy to do that. And we are always looking for more ideas. Uh, we, need, we need more ideas and people ready to make that leap into entrepreneurship. These are the companies that make what we do possible all year long. Our sustaining leaders, Bernstein Schur, Con Edison Transmission, Power Market, Power Market is Community Solar, SMRT Architects and Engineers, and Burns and Mac, you know them. Big office in, uh, in Portland, Burns and Mac just won a significant uh, uh, national award, I noticed. Uh, and this I always call our shield, so to speak. These are sustaining stewards. Uh, these companies, um, uh, this level, should you like to join it, we'd love to have you. This is $2,500 a year of support for Maine's clean tech economy. And this is 1,000. These are all very valuable to us. Uh, we, we are a membership-based organization and these are the companies that I hope you'll support. Uh, and I thank you for uh, being part of as they support us. And TRC and VHB support us all year round with all of our forums too. Basically, they buy a sponsor package for the entire year. Thank you to those companies. Would you like a print subscription to Maine Biz? Info packed, big news even today in Maine's startup economy. Um, just send us a note and we will get you a free print subscription to Maine Biz. Uh, we do set your mic off, but you can turn it on. Um, <laughs> And we want you to be engaged. When we get to Sebastian, he'll probably ask you to kind of stay on mute till he's done with his presentation. But then we're looking for, uh, you know, under Chris's direction as moderator, back and forth. That's what this is about. Speaking of Chris, 
Um, we recruited Chris for this because he knows the topic so well and most certainly better than I do. So you can see Chris's bio there. Uh, Chris, I don't know if you've been able to turn your camera on. If not, that's okay. Uh, I will advance to the next slide and uh, allow you to introduce Sebastian. Uh, Sebastian, we have given you co-host privileges so you can share your screen. So shortly we'll be going to you. But uh, Chris, now it is time for me to, uh, to allow you, to set you up to introduce Sebastian. Great, great. Well, thanks, Marty. And um, yeah, I'm not really sure what's going on with my camera. It's been working all morning, but um, I actually showered and shaved and put on a button shirt and my beard is shorter than in that picture. But unfortunately, um, you guys won't be able to see that. So we don't believe you. Um, <laughs> so I was really thrilled to have gotten this invite um, because, you know, for one, I, I'm not working much in the sector anymore, but I have a real affinity for the aquaculture sector and was, was lucky to spend about 10 years supporting it in a variety of ways. And as you're gonna hear from Sebastian, I'm sure it's, it's basically the most sustainable way to pro, uh, grow protein, which we need to feed the world. And it just contributes so much economically and culturally um, to states like Maine that have a long uh, working waterfront heritage and a history of making a living from the sea. And it's particularly important right now uh, when environmental and social forces are threatening that heritage. And it just provides tremendous opportunity for smart growth. And it's filled with remarkable entrepreneurs who are growing the sector through hard work, innovation, and thoughtfulness. Um, I was also thrilled because I've had the privilege to work pretty closely with Sebastian. And there's really nobody I've learned more from um, than him. And it was funny as I was um, thinking about this, one of the things, how I was going to introduce him, one of the things that came to mind was the first time we ever met. And um, Sebastian, I remember this like it was yesterday, um, but this is about 10 years ago. And I was coming from Augusta to meet him in Topsom because he was gracious enough to take me on a tour and give me the lay of the land. I was running a little bit late. And of course, I was stuck behind a few cars and a big slow moving cement mixing truck. And I'm sitting there in the state vehicle thinking, this is unacceptable. I can't be late to my first meeting. This is not gonna be the first impression with Sebastian. So of course I did a, an aggressive pass to get around the cars and the dump truck or the uh, cement truck and almost immediately the cement truck uh, pulled off. And there is a light blue Subaru, I think it was with a bumper sticker that said, this family is supported by the working waterfront. And it was basically behind me, uh, a little bit close. I, I think they were a little bit upset. And then it followed me the whole time and pulled into the same parking lot. And so you can probably guess who that was. Of course, it was Sebastian. Um, and so it was an even worse uh, first impression, but I don't think he held it against me. Um, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you read the slide or you probably read the slide yourselves, but just really wanted to point out a couple of things that weren't readily apparent from the test. And really, I mean, Sebastian is an absolute treasure for Maine's industry. You're really not going to find anybody who knows more about the industry from any discipline, and that's economics, operational, technological, marketing, policy, social license. And this isn't just Maine. You know, this is international, national, and at the also heavily involved at the local level. And he's viewed as a leader in all of those sectors, as evidenced by his recent appointment as chair of the National Aquaculture Association, which is the U.S. Um, industry group. He's been at this for 35 plus years, um, well before aquaculture was you know, cool. Um, and I would argue that he's largely responsible for the success the main sector has seen over the years um, and is seeing now. And so with that, um, I'll kick it over to you. And I, I look forward to hearing the questions and, um, and moderating. Wow, how do, you, how do you follow that? Oops, hang on a second. Can you guys hear me now? We sure can, sound okay. great. Sorry. Um, well, first of all, uh, don't believe a word that Chris uh, says about me. Um, second of all, uh, my recollection of that incident was I was going 80 miles an hour and he went whizzing by me at 85 miles an hour. Um, and we both laughed about it afterwards because he was driving a Prius and I was driving a Subaru. And I'm like, this guy is the most environmentally responsible guy out there, but he can still beat me on I-95. <laughs> um, so um, hu humorous start to our relationship and uh, absolutely funny how we all 
remember things differently uh, of events. But, um, and, I, and I will say right back at Chris, um, his time and his, his public service uh, working for DMR, um, he brought a level of practicality and reality um, to a public service agency um, that I think many people in the business world um, often don't realize or appreciate. I, I had the honor of serving for only three years in the public service um, at DMR uh, prior to Chris's um, time there working for Angus King's administration. And as a private sector guy going into public service, um, I remember being absolutely convinced that because I understood the technicalities of the business, because I understood what it took to grow a business, to employ people, to make payroll, um, to produce a, a product and bring it to market, I could probably um, be a more effective public resource, public agency administrator than most because I understood the private sector. And my brief three years working for a, uh, a resource management agency was a tremendously um, humbling experience. Um, and I left that uh, agency, I, I left it largely because I was just frustrated. I wasn't actually, didn't feel like I was making a difference in a short enough time period, but I also left it with a completely different understanding of what um, public servants do and the important role they play um, in balancing conflicting tensions around um, the use of public resources, uh, the development of public and private opportunities from an economic development point of view. It was a very humbling, very um, educational experience. And I, and I will say, and I mean this very sincerely, Chris, um, when you stepped into that role, and this was long after I had left, um, I learned a lot from you. Um, and, um, and I think uh, one of the things that I learned above and beyond everything else was uh, the difference a public servant can make who is really professional and well-trained in what they do versus one that's just there for a job and kind of um, taking up time until retirement. And, um, and I mean that with a great deal of respect to all our public servants, but I, I do mean that very sincerely um, with you, Chris. I think you brought a different level of professionality um, to the agency and uh, you deserve a lot of credit for it. So let's go through this quickly. I'm gonna try and establish kind of 30,000 foot level um, why aquaculture is where it is at a international, national and local level and then talk a little bit about the opportunities and constraints, and then I'm gonna leave as much time as I possibly can um, for questions. Um, I always start with this slide, which is a slide that, you know, if you're not in the food production ecosystem, um, a lot of people don't realize this, but world population levels are um, increasing dramatically. Equally importantly, the standard of living at an international level is increasing dramatically. So the standard of living in China by the year 2030 um, is gonna equal the standard of living in the United States of America. What that means for resources in particular and particularly food is really quite dramatic. Um, and so the population level is increasing, but the other thing that's going on is standard of living are driving changes in diets. And if you're not in the food world, you probably don't pay any attention to this, but the reality is for China, Brazil, and India, the, the BRIC companies, uh, countries rather, um, their diets are changing dramatically. And what that means is there is an increasing demand for protein internationally. So we don't have to just double the amount of food we're going to produce but we have to over double the amount of protein we're gonna produce. And that is particularly 
important with respect to animal protein uh, in diets. Those two things combined are um, putting a dramatically increased demand on food systems and in particular protein production systems. The other part of the equation that's happening globally is that there are some very fundamental resource trends which are happening, um, which we frankly have no control over, um, but they are gonna drive what happens globally, but they're also gonna drive what happens in the United States of America with respect to food systems and food markets. And the three big things that are impacting food production systems are we are losing roughly 100,000 acres a year of arable land globally. And that's primarily due to um, the, the abuse of land, if you will, from uh, over irrigation, salinization, um, the spread of urban uh, centers, so urbanization, sprawl, um, and um, the irresponsible uh, use of land um, around, say, forestry, agriculture, whatever. We're, we're, we're basically, in some parts of the world, we're creating dust bowls, and that is linked to climate change and the shifts in precipitation levels. So we are, and this is one of those statistics that you know most people in the world don't know about, don't track, but the United Nations FAO keeps track of this because it relates to food production. We are pumping world aquifer levels in excess of their recharge rates at an alarming rate. Oh, over 87% of the world aquifers are being pumped in excess of their recharge rates. And what that means is we are essentially mining water to produce food. The second fundamental resource limit that we are beginning to bump up against is phosphorus reserves. Uh, phosphorus is a mined mineral. It's not like nitrogen. We can't create it through biological or chemical, artificial uh, chemical um, processes. Phosphorus is mined from phosphorus reserves and world phosphorus reserves at current usage rates um, run out in 2030. And, you know, what does that mean to us? We're, 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 pumping more water than we are actually recharging. We're using more phosphorus um, than we have discovered so far or been able to produce so far. Populations are increasing, diets are shifting, uh, standards of living are shifting. We're losing agricultural um, production land. Um, all of those things are coming together at a clash from a resource point of view. And so, for any of us who have children, in our children's generation, we are going to have to find a way to solve this clash between demand and supply, between resources and uh, production capacity. And this is a very, very serious uh, challenge um, that we are gonna face globally. We'll face it locally in individual countries. You'll see, um, depending on whose intelligence or resource um, analysis reports you're reading, these things will cause massive shifts in populations. We're already seeing some of those shifts occurring in the world, certainly shifts from North Africa into Europe, Mexico and Central America into the United States are being driven by some of these resource challenges um, that we're facing. So what has this got to do with aquaculture and why, why does this have any relevancy to aquaculture, both at an international level and a national level? Well, it turns out that producing food and particularly animal protein and to a slightly lesser extent, plant protein in water, as opposed to on land, has some inherent efficiencies. And those efficiencies are linked to two fundamental um, physical rules, if you will. In water, animals and plants burn little or no energy to thermoregulate themselves. They don't burn any calories from their daily caloric consumption or creation 
to maintain their body temperature different than the environment they're in. They are the same temperature as the water that they live in. Counter that to land, uh, for, for you as land animals, um, you burn between 10 and 20% of your calories on a, on a daily basis to either thermoregulate or to resist gravity. And in the case of aquatic animals and plants, um, they burn relatively few calories to resist gravity because they can use buoyancy. They can use lipids in their tissues or uh, gases in swim bladders or swim, swim uh, bladders and plants um, to maintain themselves against gravity. So those two fundamental physiological and physical characteristics mean that aquatic animals and plants are inherently more efficient at converting energy to consumable product. And this is a slide that shows a comparison of the feed intake or the use of fresh water to create animal protein in this case. Um, and you'll see that uh, in the case of, for example, Atlantic salmon, which is obviously um, vilified by the environmental community as being somehow bad from an environmental point of view, they are compared to terrestrial animal protein uh, creation, uh, much more efficient and much more effective, both in the use of feed to uh, animal protein or the use of fresh water um, to animal protein. An interesting aside is um, if you compare wild salmon to farm salmon um, and you talk to any of the fundamental physiologists in the field, uh, Jay Brett, for example, who is a guy that I did a lot of my early career work with from the University of British Columbia, it takes roughly 10 pounds of wild forage fish to create one pound of wild salmon. And the reason for that is because wild salmon have to search for, hunt down, pursue, capture, and kill their prey versus a farmed fish that doesn't have to do any of that. All of their feed is presented to them. And in addition to that, the feed is formulated um, to be ideal from the conversion perspective. Um, and so it's very efficient at converting feed to um, finished product, if you will. And that's true to an even greater extent, for example, with shellfish. There's an additional part of this kind of conversion efficiency story, which is often not told, which is the yield retention uh, equation um, for finfish, and in particular Atlantic salmon versus terrestrial animals. And again, if you look at these numbers, these are all peer reviewed published data, um, you'll find that um, the harvest yield in terms of not just the conversion efficiency, but what you actually get out of what you end up with um, is much higher in aquatic animals and plants than it is in terrestrial animals and plants. And that goes back to some of the basic biological characteristics of the animals and plants which are being cultured in water. But it also goes back to the digestibility and the physics of conversion uh, for those aquatic animals and plants versus terrestrial animals and plants. So when you add all of that up, if we have to double food production globally in the world, um, and we have to do that in the face of resource restraints, um, I think it is not an unreasonable assertion to say that ultimately, probably several generations from now, we will probably grow and provide more food from the aquatic environments that we will from terrestrial environments. And I realize that's a radical statement, but I think the science supports that statement. This is true uh, in terms of aquatic plants as well. Um, many people don't realize, but the most consumed grain in the world, uh, rice, is also the most uh, consumptive uh, grain from a freshwater uh, consumption point of view. And so, uh, you compare that to seaweeds, for example, where we use virtually no fresh water, a little bit of fresh water in the hatchery phase or the processing phase. Um, but you compare that to rice, um, again, aquatic plants turn out to be incredibly efficient 
from an environmental and a conversion point of view. So from a national perspective, and this is again, stuff that a lot of people in kind of Joe and Jane Doe Q public don't recognize or understand, virtually all of the seafood we consume in this country is actually imported. And less than 2% of that import is inspected for any sort of contaminants or residues. And that's a real issue because farms or harvesters or processors in other countries around the world are not required to comply with the same kind of regulatory best management uh, practice or certification standards that we are in this country. And so you often hear about bad stuff going on in either commercial fisheries or aquaculture, um, but people often don't distinguish between what happens in the United States of America versus what happens in these other producing countries around the world. If you look at the percentage of seafood which is imported and you look at the percentage of that seafood which is actually produced on farmed, and you do the math, over 59% of seafood that is consumed in this country is actually coming out of farms. It's not coming out of wild fisheries. And most of those farms are not regulated to the same extent that the US farms are. Seafood is one of the most highly traded commodities in the world. Um, and in 2018, it contributed over $17 billion to our trade deficit. Seafood trades places with cars, oil, and uh, interestingly, um, clothes um, as being the largest uh, contributor to our national trade deficit, depending on what commodity is hot and where the markets are, are, are going or not. But uh, seafood has always been one of the top five contributors to our US national trade deficit. Um, we are the third largest seafood market in the world, the US is. And that's kind of ironic um, because we rank 17th in the world in terms of aquaculture production. And this is you know, demonstrated if you, if you compare seafood and aquaculture production or, or commodities rather, compared to other protein sources in the marketplace, we produce virtually all of the turkey, pork, chicken, and beef that we consume in this country domestically. There are very few imports for those protein sources. On the other hand, with respect to seafood and particularly aquaculture produced seafood, um, we produce very little of what is consumed in this country domestically. For us as domestic farmers, um, we view that as an opportunity. And this is where it gets to um, talking about opportunities and constraints. Um, we have some advantages um, and we should be able to compete and produce more domestically to serve that domestic market because we are the third largest marketplace in the world um, and because we have opportunity to serve that market in ways that some of our competitors from other countries probably don't. And in particular, our opportunities are focused around the fresh seafood market, not the frozen seafood market. This is um, data coming out of the FAO, USDA and, and Department of Commerce over the last 20 years um, worth of ag average annual growth rate in aquaculture. And if you look at uh, aquaculture globally, it's been growing at roughly 8% per year annually. You compare that to agriculture, agriculture has been growing at about 1.1% growth rate annually globally. Um, and aquaculture globally is the fastest food production, fastest growing food production method in the world. The US is way behind. Um, we have been averaging roughly 1% per year. And in fact, in the last couple of years, we've been down, not up. Um, so the 20 year average is, is great. It's, it's 1%, but compared to globally, it's, it's pretty pathetic. And uh, in recent years, we've actually been down and that's largely been driven by the catfish industry and the fact that um, catfish uh, farmers have found it more profitable to plant their ponds with corn and grow ethanol than they have um, to grow catfish in their ponds. 
The irony of this is that we have uh, the world's largest exclusive economic zone, the EEZ. And on this map, you'll see the areas which are outlined in red and are yellow are the US EEZ. And that is the, the area, if you will, that we have control of as a nation. It is in fact larger than the landmass we have uh, on the continental United States. Um, granted, and, and to fair disclosure, it does not mean that all of that area is easily developable from an aquaculture perspective. But the interesting thing which is going on at an international level is you're seeing very significant investment in places like China, Japan, Norway, um, beginning in the UK, uh, into very high energy sites, which are remotely offshore with very large scale technology. And I suspect that that's where you're gonna see some of the largest increases in production internationally. And we have a very large EUZ in the United States of America. So there are opportunities there that we have not even begin uh, to capitalize on, begin to uh, even think about from an investment or regulatory or a, a policy point of view. These are just some visuals and the kinds of things that we grow in Maine. We have a very diverse um, sector in Maine, aquaculture sector in Maine, um, probably one of the most diverse of any state in the country. We grow over 25 species here in Maine. We have four principal species that we grow from an economic impact point of view, um, salmon, mussels, oysters, and seaweed. Um, and then we have a whole series of other species which are smaller um, in the development phase. Some of them will succeed, some of them probably will fail, um, but we have quite a diverse sector, both from a species point of view and from a production method point of view. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, from a, just a pure statistics point of view, we have a, a, over, it's now over 152 farms um, in the state. These are um, both freshwater and saltwater farms. Some of them have multiple sites. Uh, we have 54 pending lease applications, and I'll, I'll circle back around to that. We have uh, roughly 800 what are called limited purpose aquaculture licenses. This was a system which was designed um, to reduce the barrier to entry for new entrepreneurs and to allow existing entrepreneurs to prospect for new sites. I think those 800 LPAs may uh, translate into 125, 150 um, different farms over the next five to eight years. Um, all of those are pre-revenue. One of the really commonly held misbeliefs is that once a lease is granted, um, it's permanent. And if you actually look at the data, um, there have been over 110 that have been terminated, denied, or expired since 2009. So that idea that uh, a lease is somehow a permanent uh, property right is really not supported by the data. Um, we lease from you, the citizens of the state of Maine, uh, over 1,700 acres. 1,700 acres fits, to put things in perspective, a um, little bit, uh, it's, it's a little bit bigger than the Portland airport, a little bit, uh, roughly 300 acres smaller than the size of the Rockland Harbor. So if you go to the Rockland uh, and walk out on the, on the breakwater and turn inland to look at the harbor, um, we're smaller than that area on an annual basis. We have three to five different land-based, what are called recirculating aquaculture um, um, system startups. Um, and I say three to five because you can dep it depends on who you believe, what stage they're in the permitting process or um, the pre-application or a construction phase. Um, those projects, um, if you assume that say four of them are gonna be fully built out um, and come to fruition. Um, they represent over a billion dollars worth of capital investment in the state of Maine. So they're very significant. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard about the controversy around some of those um, and glad to answer any questions around that. I, I will say uh, this, 
RAS technology has been around for a long time. Um, both our shellfish and our salmon folks have used RAS technology in their hatcheries for many years. It's not a new technology. Um, the projects in Maine and the projects in other parts of the world are going to test a, a hypothesis which has been out there for a while, which is that um, no significant uh, recirculating aquaculture um, project that is land-based has made money so far. And the reason for that is they haven't been built at a big enough scale. And so the projects in Maine and in Europe uh, Scandinavia and uh, and in Florida, for example, um, all of which are being proposed and constructed and built out at much larger scales than has been proposed before, are going to test that hypothesis. They're going to um, answer the question whether the challenge with land-based RES has been scale and whether or not if you go to large enough scale, um, you can actually make them work financially. We buy goods and services from roughly 480 uh, companies. Um, and that's a part of the value chain, which actually um, a lot of people don't really understand. The interesting thing for me is aquaculture in the state of Maine has gotten to a critical size, a critical uh, mass, if you will, to the point where we have goods and services companies, which are specializing in aquaculture. Um, legal firms, accounting firms, um, technical gear development firms, software firms, um, all of those uh, specialties, all of those concentrations have emerged probably within the last 10 years or so. And many of those firms are now providing goods and services, not just to Maine farmers, but to farmers around the country and indeed internationally as well. Um, our gross revenues at a farm gate level, so that's the point of first sale, um, vary on any given year between 80 and 100 million dollars. We have not had a, a good rigorous economic impact study done um, for a number of years. Um, one of those is going on now and we look forward to the, the data coming out of that. We think that that, that data is gonna show a fairly dramatically increased um, farm gate uh, sales number as well as uh, an economic impact number. And we employ between 650 and 700 people directly. We employ another probably 350 people on a seasonal basis. So if you compare Maine from a growth rate point of view to the country and to the international global growth rate, you'll see that we're a little higher than the American uh, national growth rate and we are significantly lower um, than the global growth rate. So what's driven this growth? And I think uh, there are a number of factors that have done that. Um, number one, and probably uh, one of the biggest factors, we have amazing growing conditions in Maine. We have an incredibly clean environment um, and we have a temperature and, and kind of water quality profile, um, which is really unmatched on the East Coast. And, and uh, really unmatched at a national level, probably the only state which comes closest to Maine um, from a water quality perspective is Alaska. Um, and that reflects itself in the quality of the products that we produce and the ability of farms to be successful because their animals and plants are doing well in optimal conditions and I'll talk a little bit about the relationship between the farm and the environment in a moment. Um, there are a number of other uh, factors that have really um, helped our sector grow. Um, we've got some very rigorous uh, environmental uh, regulations, uh, fish health regulations, shellfish health regulations. We still have a working waterfront uh, in this state compared to many other states along the East Coast in particular. Um, We've lowered the barrier to entry for small owner operators. And that was a very intentional policy um, decision that was made to try and get, uh, to, in particular, to try and help people from traditional working waterfront families diversify into aquaculture. And then we've been running training academies in the state of Maine for the last 20 years, again, targeting traditional working waterfront families. I would say the training academies and the lower barrier to entry for small farms 
are the two biggest reasons that we've seen the growth that we've seen uh, recently in the sector. Probably the other reason we're seeing growth is um, demand. Uh, the main brand is worth something, uh, not just main seafood, but main aquaculture products in particular typically get paid anywhere from 10 to 15% more in the marketplace for their products. There are, there are some very simple reasons for that. Um, anybody who's been in the restaurant business will understand the concept of food costs, will understand the concept of shelf life. Um, coming out of main waters, we are coming out of cold water and we are within a 24 hour truck drive of roughly 130 million consumers. So um, Chicago East, Atlanta North, um, we can hit those markets very quickly after harvesting our product. They're coming out of cold water. Those two things translate into a much longer shelf life um, for our products and a much higher quality for our products than our competitors, which are coming in oftentimes from parts of the country which grow products in warm water or that are being imported into the United States of America from other countries. Um, and so they have longer transport times, higher transport costs. For anybody who believes that we are a unregulated um, sector, oops, um, I just put this up here. These are the national authorities, regional authorities, state authorities, and the federal oversight acts that have um, oversight over our sector. Glad to talk about this at any point in time. I am not making an argument for less regulation. I am just making the point that we are highly regulated and uh, many of those regulations are regulations that most people don't understand the connections around. And when you are a business person trying to build a business, you have to understand those connections very directly, very intimately. And many times, um, even though an agency or an act may not have a direct permitting authority over you, it has an indirect authority over you through the consulting process that the permitting agency uh, conducts. So as an example, when DMR um, grants a lease in the state, they consult with all their sister, fate, um, their sister state agencies and their federal state agencies. Many times those agencies will request conditions be placed on a lease, even though that sister agency has no direct permitting authority over the operation, they can impose permit conditions or lease conditions on that operation through that consulted process. And they do routinely. This was an interesting study that was relatively recently compare, uh, prepared, comparing um, just doing a kind of a literature and a legal review of the kinds of restrictions that are direct or indirect imposed from a federal level on production for different kinds of protein producers. And if you look at aquaculture compared to cattle, hog, poultry, or sheep, it's pretty clear um, that there are many, many more federal restrictions placed on aquaculture than there are these other food producing sectors. Um, it was an eye opener to those of us who were in the sector. Many of us had felt that we were having more um, restrictions imposed on us, but nobody had looked at it from a quantitative review point of view um, and, uh, and, and compared it to other food production methods. And this was a, a, a very interesting and uh, frankly troubling uh, publication that has just come out. The state has a whole series of regulatory uh, components. I'm not going to go through them all, but i um, glad to, to talk to or answer any questions about them. But uh, I will say this, Maine is often used as kind of the gold standard by other states or other countries, in fact, in terms of the regulatory systems we have here and how they balance public trust protecting the environment, um, protecting applicants' rights, um, and still allowing businesses to go through a process whereby they can in fact start a business and develop um, 
a business that produces a, a product. Probably the single biggest challenge for us um, as marine resource users, as members of the working waterfront, is the gentrification of Maine's coastline. Um, and the reason it's a bigger challenge for us than it is perhaps for the commercial fishing community is we have to ask permission and go through a public process to be allowed to conduct our business. And the fundamental things that are driving this gentrification have been exacerbated by COVID, by the ability to work remotely, by the ability um, to come to Maine, um, and the fact that Maine, from a real estate perspective, is a cheap date compared to Connecticut, uh, New Jersey, New York, uh, Massachusetts. And so we've seen this increased influx of people from away, and I mean no insult by that, it's just a, a term that's able to kind of characterize a particular demographic group. And um, at the same time, we've seen pressures on our traditional working waterfront resource base, the, the resources that support our commercial fishing uh, sector. We've seen uh, pressure on uh, any sort of an extractive use of those commercial resources. And we've seen a decrease in the number of people who are able to qualify for commercial fishing permits um, over time. And so those two trends are coming together and putting pressure on working waterfronts and aquaculture is kind of caught in the middle of those trends. So I'll, I'll end here and just say that um, this is the main seal. Uh, I suspect most of you are familiar with it. There are two gentlemen on this seal. One is a farmer and one is a merchant mariner or, or a commercial fisherman. My folks are the merging of those two traditions. They are uh, the merging of the farming tradition and the going down to the ocean to make a living tradition. Um, we are the younger face of the new working waterfront in Maine. If you look at the demographics of the people who are coming into our sector, um, there are a tremendous number of young people um, who are starting small farms. Um, some of them will make it, some of them won't. Um, but to have young people coming into a marine resource uh, business community is tremendously exciting. Um, if you compare the average age of folks in aquaculture to the average age of folks in commercial fishing, you'll see there's about a 20 year gap. Um, and we are certainly the younger group in that entity. Um, the challenge we have is seizing the opportunity that the state of Maine has with respect to producing this amazing high quality healthy seafood to serve the market demand that we are seeing in the United States of America in a timely way that we as producers can compete from a cost of production point of view. And I will stop there and thank you so much. That's great, Chris. I see that you're not only a, um, a aquaculture expert, you're a tech wizard, you got your camera going. So, uh, and it looks like some of the questions are starting to come in. So let's hear a great Q&A. Yeah, we'll I, I employed a box of uh, tissues and my laptop um, and uh, you can see my, my lower third. So um, yeah, well, thank you so much, Sebastian. That was great. Um, I see we've got a few questions. Uh, one question coming in from, from Doug Slocum. And I would say to everybody on the call, feel free to um, you know, speak up and unmute yourself in between questions or type them into the chat. So we're pretty laid back. Sebastian, can you see Doug's question? I can if I look at the, I can if look at the chat. Um, okay, yes. Uh, where do you see the future growth onshore, RAS or other nearshore, future offshore into the EZ? Um, uh, great question, it's a very common question. I think, I think potentially we could see growth in all three areas. Um, the, you know, each of those areas um, present different challenges. There's no question that at an international level, um, there is growth going on in the land-based RES sector. And there's also, um, a, frankly, 
amazing growth going on in the offshore uh, sector uh, production area. Um, the challenges that the RAS folks uh, face are the cost of production <coughs> um, and the, the CapEx cost. The challenges that the offshore folks face are probably technology and um, license acquisition. And in, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in the US, um, probably also, um, you know, conflicts with other users. <coughs> so offshore wind is obviously a dominant uh, player. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. I'm post-COVID. So I, <coughs> I think the offshore environment is, is very interesting, but it's challenging from a user conflict perspective. Um, and I don't, I don't think, you know, it's going to be tough to compete with the, the offshore wind folks um, from a financial point of view at this stage of the game. Um, Nearshore, I think we're going to see slow but steady growth. Nothing spectacular, but just a kind of a, a constant steady growth. All right, we've got another question um, from Patrick Lyons, who asked, the aquaculture thoughts on how the aquaculture industry addresses issues with opposition for shorefront owners and some fishermen, education, outreach, changes to processes, et cetera. Yeah, so <coughs> Patrick, this is a this is an area that you're obviously front and center in. Um, we just we need to tell, we need to educate people on what we're doing. Um, and we're certainly from the association's perspective, um, we have dedicated over a third of our annual budget to that effort um, over the next uh, five years. We are small potatoes compared to the opposition. We don't have the pockets that the Rockefellers do. Um, and that's really what's driving a lot of the opposition. Um, very wealthy landowners um, who maybe, <clears throat> maybe only come here for two or three weeks a year um, and do not want to look, see, hear, or smell um, working, working people, working waterfronts. Um, we also are lucky in the sense that we have some partnerships that are evolving in terms of the educational part of things. And um, hopefully we will have more on the ground um, efforts to try and educate the public around who we are and what we do. Um, at the end of the day, <clears throat> the reality is there are a very small group of people who really don't care um, about what we do or what we're doing. They just don't wanna look at us or see us or hear us. Um, I don't think we will ever be successful in changing those people's opinion, um, but we are committed as a group of farmers, as an association, um, to telling our story better than we ever have and to explain to people who we are and what we're not. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there, frankly. Um, and there are a lot of people who are making money uh, over polarizing the debate and misleading people. And I, I will say just, you know, as a main citizen, that's a disappointment to me. That's That doesn't feel like who we are as Maine. We've always been as Maine a, a state which is focused on solutions, opportunity, and practicality. And um, some of the debate has been driven into much more um, kind of public relations, hyperbole, opportunistic fundraising, um, and intentional uh, misinformation. And that's a, that's a disappointing turn of events. Thanks, Sebastian. We've got a question from Jeff Smith, and this is actually one that I was curious about myself. Um, do you think there is an opportunity to co-locate offshore aquaculture within the footprint of an offshore wind farm to minimize conflicts with other ocean users? Well, so <clears throat> technically, um, there have been a number of projects, and I, and I have personally been involved in a number of projects in other parts of the world around co-location. Um, 
I don't think the process of co-location inherently reduces conflict with other user groups. Um, and if you look at the controversy which is going on or the debate which is going on around offshore wind and the fishing community right now, um, for us as aquaculturalists to suggest that we would co-locate with wind wouldn't necessarily uh, reduce the perceived conflict around user conflicts between aquaculture and wind. So um, I, I will say, you know, from a technical point of view, it's something that can be done. Um, from a conflict point of view, theoretically, in terms of use of space, um, yes, it, it might be a way of optimizing the use of space and reducing conflict. But um, right now, the way the, the offshore wind um, and energy uh, sector is being kind of rammed through the process um, without um, really, I would, I would say, um, significant consultation with other user groups um, is, is really elevating the conflict around uh, offshore wind. And whether you believe that offshore renewables are the right thing or the wrong thing to do, um, I think the process itself um, has exacerbated those conflicts and really not given some of the traditional resource users uh, of those areas the voice that they deserve. And that's very different than what happens with aquaculture. Currently with aquaculture, <clears throat> if we apply for a lease um, and the commercial fishing community or the recreational community or, or whoever else, can demonstrate significant use of an area, we by law will not get that lease. Um, that's, that is embedded in the law. Um, so there's a very significant consultative process that occurs um, during an application for an aquaculture lease. Uh, and if uh, it can be demonstrated that that area is being used significantly by another user group, um, you're wasting your time. You're not gonna get a lease. That's not the case with offshore winds. So I would say that we're, <clears throat> we're uh, cautious about the idea of co-location because we believe that the current process around offshore wind is really um, not one that gives all user groups uh, a fair voice in the process. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sebastian. And um, I think we're, we're out of time, but that was great. And I know I learned um, some and um, I'm sure everybody else learned, learned a lot who's not as familiar with that sector. So <clears throat> I think, Marty, did you wanna? Yes, thank you so much. It was a great discussion. So just quickly highlight a couple of things that are coming up. Uh, we are doing a forum on electric rates. It is, the date and time is set. And we have some great panelists. However, we have room for another panelist or two. So if that's your area of expertise or interest, uh, please let me know. And uh, we're looking for uh, more topics to give on the E2 Tech Connects. Uh, Sebastian's given us a great industry overview in aquaculture. We're interested in doing something on mining and also in battery recycling and many other sectors. We'd like to keep staying involved and uh, keep our membership uh, having this great back and forth. Uh, so we thank you. The recording and the notes will be coming shortly to your inbox. I hope that you'll enjoy the uh, rest of this uh, beautiful day and uh, stay tuned for our next E2 Tech event. We'll be doing some fun in-person networking over the summer too. So we'll leave it there. We'll thank you again for joining. Sebastian, thank you so much for uh, the discussion. Chris, thank you for moderating and we we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Take great. care. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.